Hi, my name is Drew McQueenie, and uh, today we have a very special guest, guest here at the HitFix headquarters, Jeff Nichols, the writer and director of Midnight Special. Um, Jeff, the first thing I wanted to ask you about is the, the movie itself and the initial idea for it, because it's the, the bones of this thing are familiar, but right. the specific version of the story that you're telling, I think, has, has really fascinating uh, underpinnings, both in the community that Alton comes out of, right. and then just in how you handle the governmental sort of presence in the movie. Right. Um, can you talk about wh where it came from? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, when I write these things, I, I kind of write on, on two different tracks at once. One is this genre track. It's it's like this candy coating that, that wraps around some other, hopefully, um, more palpable, more emotional idea that's really specific to my life. And uh, it seems like all my other films have have gone this way, you know, so now this is four times in, I'm starting to understand the rhythm of that process a little bit more. And, you know, I was immediately struck with an image for this film of two guys in a really fast souped up car moving through the American South, these back roads in the middle of the night. Um, and I started asking myself questions, you know, where are they going? Why can they only move at night? Who's chasing them? And that's where the genre elements really started to unfold. And it wasn't until you know, I went to the, the second phase of the writing process when it was like, all right, well, but what's all this mean? What's this really add up to that? All the personal feelings about how I, uh, how I was dealing with being a new father. This was written in my first year of fatherhood, how all of that applied to it. So I think, you know, the inspirations come from the genre and the specificity come from my life. And that's kind of what, what breaks it apart a little bit. What do you know about Alton Meyer? I wouldn't know where to start. He would have fits. Things would break. It was like a feeling. Kind of feeling. <laughs> we need to know where he is. You all have no clue what you're dealing with, do you? thinks you're their savior. One of the things that's most striking so far about your filmography is your relationship with Michael Shannon. And right. I, I love him as a lead. I love how uh, wide a range of things he's gotten to play recently. It feels like people are uh, into it and letting him do crazier things. And sure. Not just... I think the box he was in for a little while in Hollywood. Right. Um, for you, writing now, do you picture Michael? Is Michael part of that process for you? Do you because that relationship is so interesting? Yeah, and he has been since my first film. You know, I wrote Shock and Stories specifically for him. I wrote Take Shelter. Actually, wasn't written specifically for him, but it wasn't a far leap, you know, to get there. Uh, having worked with him in Shock and Stories, Mud. You know, I wrote for Matthew McConaughey. So I do this where I, I write these things for people. And Midnight Special was specifically crafted. You know, for Mike, I think, I think part of it is obviously because of his stature and his look and everything else. Everybody wants him to be a bad guy, but when you are confronted with an actor that's just that good, um, he's not that easily relegated to that to that niche. You know, and I think maybe a lesser actor um, would be quite content just going to work, playing the baddie, and that that's it. But he's so smart. And, I, and he's so talented, I think it's kind of inevitable that he will, you know, um, um, lash out from, from those initial ideas. Um, I, when we went to the uh, Man of Steel junket, I had my kids with me that day, yeah. and they got a chance to meet Michael. And it was right after seeing him play, you know, as bad a bad guy as there is. Right. And he was so lovely. Yeah. And the relationship he has with Alton in the film... Um, I always feel like when you're making a movie where there's this kind of central relationship between a, an adult and a child, that actor, the adult actor, is almost your co-director in terms of handling that kid to some degree. Oh, for sure. Um, can you talk about their relationship and sort of uh, how you help them uh, yeah, foster that? I didn't help too much. You know, Mike Mike is a very pragmatic guy, but luckily so is Jaden, the, the boy who plays Alton. Um, he's, he's very mature for his age, and, and, you know, they didn't, it's not like they pretended like, oh, now I've got to act like I love you because I'm your dad, so come give me a hug. Mike just went in and was really respectful to him and um, and would just kind of 
was just nice to him, you know, uh, but it wasn't gooey. It wasn't like they were try, overly trying to, you know, uh, put on this act of, of some kind of relationship that they know they don't have because they just met five minutes ago, you know, and, and that's just Mike's personality, but fortunately it suited Jaden, you know, so that by, there was a point in the process where I think they really did respect each other. Like they really were leaning on each other to get through some of these emotional scenes. Like it's like they, they needed each other uh, in terms of, of partners in a scene. And at that point, since Mike hadn't spoken down to him, hadn't, you know, patted him on the head and said, you cute kid. Uh, when we came to those kind of rubber meets the road emotional scenes, I think there was a lot of respect, mutual respect between the two of them. And, and that's a lot on Mike and it's a lot on Jaden. Um, a lot of times the easy choice in a movie like this is to make the government um, just a bad guy or to, to create a, a sort of sense that it's just malicious. Sure. And I really like the direction you took Adam Driver's character. I have a friend who is an astrophysicist. Oh. And if you mention E.T. to him, he gets he, he will sputter indignantly about how it's a horror film about the poor guy with the keys who just wanted to study this alien yes. that would help us unlock immortality. And this right. kid ruined it all. Right. And I, I like that your film has a very different approach to what Adam Driver's after and sort of how he goes about it. Well, you know, two things. Um, one, just to talk about the government as a sub character or a subplot in my movie like that was the thing most easily open to cliche you know I, I don't know anything about the NSA not really who does uh you know I don't know much about the inner workings of of uh, secret government organizations so I just tried to look at it kind of like the DMV you know um it's just this giant bureaucratic process that no one character is going to get a full point of view on, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it somehow made uh, that character more relatable just in terms of he's not in the control room with all the generals saying, and now we're gonna send the drone and now we're gonna do this. All that stuff, you see the effects of all those decisions, mm -hmm. but you don't really know where they're happening, when they're happening, or who is making those decisions. And that seemed appropriate. Government seems like a very big entity to me. Yeah. It doesn't seem like a centralized thing. Um, oddly enough, I wrote this before the Snowden, you know, kind of um, stuff broke, and and I think I was actually shocked at how how much they did have kind of centralized and put together. But I still stand by that kind of thinking of how the, the federal government operates. Now, that's separate from Adam Driver's character. Right. You know, Adam Driver's character is, in my mind, and again, this is, this is a, a, a dangerous place to be when you're writing, But because uh, usually I'm writing about myself or my son or some, something very personal and specific or my buddy. But in this, I wanted to take Richard Dreyfuss's character from Jaws and Truffaut's character from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, put them together, and make and make a government scientist. Um, it just felt like a cool thing to have in this movie. Now that could have been terrible, you know, and maybe some people think it is. But when you add Adam Driver to that mix, you add such a thoughtful actor. He's going to come in, and he's not thinking of it as this amalgam. Uh, he's thinking of it as a person. And he uh, starts immediately asking questions about, like, why do you have me, you know, with this tape recorder that's completely superfluous, you know, when they have recorders behind me going straight into computers? And why am I always using legal pads? Like, there's, there's a reason for this, Jeff. And I was like, well, you know, I think he's this analog guy who is in a digital world, but that's how his brain works. You know, his brain fires at a pretty rapid level. And this starts to build character. And what it really starts to build is a worldview. It starts to build this idea that he has probably the best mind in the room, right? But he's smart enough to know his limitations of his own mind. Mm -hmm. And that maybe the math, his math, isn't complete enough to give him all the answers. And there might be a bigger math equation. There might be a bigger variable out there that, um, that he can't quite comprehend, but he wants to. And that's, that's a worldview. And that's a cool, I think that's a cool idea. Well, I, the the look of this film is another major part of what I reacted to, and it's it's so beautiful. It's the the way you've captured sort of those those country roads and the side roads, and and what it looks like when you're trying to stay off of highways and freeways right. and major thoroughfares. There's a, a whole part of America that's going away as we right. get more and more reliant on, you know, certain kinds of transport. So I love that this movie captures that, and it does it in this really. It reminds me absolutely of sort of early Spielberg or sure, of Carpenter's Express. Starman. Um, yeah. and, and there's something great about shooting it for real. 
Well, yeah, and, and that's kind of been a, a hallmark of, of my approach from the beginning, which is, well, let's go to these places and, and let's, let's shoot these things. It lined up very well with the story, these guys that are trying to be off the grid, you know. But the American South is a, it's an interesting place. It's, it's quickly becoming homogenized, you know. Um, but something interesting happened in the American South when, when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s. So all these small towns in Arkansas where I grew up used to be quite vibrant, you know, because you would need all of these people to farm all of this, this land. So that's why every little town had a drugstore. Every little town had a furniture store. It was a real local economy. Well, then agriculture became mechanized, and farming took three people, not a thousand. And so you have these amazing back roads and these amazing, this infrastructure that is, uh, it's just gone it's forgotten, you know, they tend the main roads, but there are all these other places. And I just thought, um, what a great place to be leapfrogging all through night, you know, uh, through the American South. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful part of, of our country, I guess. Thematically, I, I think the movie is, it's a, it's a lovely way of dealing with the, the journey that we as parents go on with our kids, which is that, gradual realization that they are independent human beings yes. and they are going to have this their own life and we can either support that or we can fight against it but Certainly. it's going to happen and i i think it gets there very beautifully but then the science fiction side of the story you resolve it is yeah. not an ambiguous movie and right. although you may not spell everything out i think you give the viewers a lot of answers at the end of the film for sure um that's I always a let tricky see thing it. yeah i yeah. let them see it and that, yeah. that's so tricky to get right because obviously i mean there's you know close encounters the easiest knock to make on it is he's the worst father of all time in that mm -hmm. movie. Yeah, right. He just looks, he leaves the planet and never looks back. And it's a weird emotional journey that they kind of take us on. For sure. Yours really ends in, it feels like the right place, both thematically and for the science fiction elements. Well, thanks. You know, a lot of people hate it. You know, a lot of people say, oh no, he showed too much. Uh, there's a whole other swath of people that say, oh, I, that doesn't make enough sense. I, I don't know what's going on. So, you know, you've, you've set yourself up for a narrative um, tightrope, and, and a lot of people are going to fall off that tightrope, you know, when they're following you through this story. But that's just the deal. You know, that's the, that's the agreement you have to make. Uh, I, I felt like it was really necessary in this film to, to have it go someplace, you know. Now, you don't know the point of view of this place that we end up in. Um, and that was really important to me as well, because in early test screenings and stuff with the studio, they, everybody wanted to know. Um, but at the same time, I, it just felt like a cop out. If you're going to get there, see people's eyes grow and never cut to what they're looking at. Now, no, of course, Spielberg taught us very greatly in Jaws. The barrels are more interesting than the shark. I got it, you know? Like, I know the lesson. I know the rule. I made a movie that is 80% that. Yeah. But it just felt like a cop-out not to try. Now, no, I'm not going to please everybody, um, but I'm willing to accept that because I think there's some bigger ideas there. And also, I don't write these things for that to be the final thought, you know? Like, I don't really care if you like um, the practicals uh, of, of how I end my movie. What I care about is... Are you on the same emotional page with these characters? It was the same thing for Take Shelter. It's like if I can somehow bring you to an emotional conclusion and wrap that up and have that feel like a complete thought, then I'm good. Everything else is window dressing. What I like about the way Warner Brothers has handled this film is it's obviously they, they care about the movie and they're being very careful with how they're getting it in front yeah. of people and how they're rolling it out in theaters. Um, there was a moment where you were talking about doing Aquaman as well. Mm -hmm. um, Working with a bigger studio is a jump for you, just as a filmmaker, because it's a different kind of machine that you step into. Right. You seem like you're having a good experience on this. Very. Um, are you interested in doing those those bigger canvas pictures? And if so, how do you find the personal way to work in that space? Well, that's the not a million dollar question. That's the hundred million dollar question. And I think there's an answer to it. I just haven't found it yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been just unsuccessful enough. Uh, in the career trajectory that I've been on that no one's offered me that job that I couldn't walk away from before I was ready for it. And now, for better or worse, um, I kind of know who I am as a filmmaker, you know? Uh, I, I, I understand my process when it comes to making a film. Now, that doesn't mean I'll make a successful film or a good film, but it'll, I'll make my film. Right. And so I need to be presented with um, a story that, number one, I can write. 
uh, I think I need to write it because that's how I feel most comfortable behind the camera. When an actor comes up to me and says, now why is my character doing this? I can tell him exactly, because I had a reason for when I put that on the page. And that's a confidence thing that is very hard to step into as a director. So I think I have to write them kind of from the ground up. And I think it has to be, um, it has to be a property that, that I, can, I can control narratively, you know? And I have to be with a studio that, um, that when I sit down and write it, they read it and like what I've done. You know, I was really specific with Warner Brothers when I, when I came into the front door with this script. I wasn't coming looking for a development job. I didn't want notes. If you don't like it, I completely understand. It's not for everybody. I'll, I'll go, you know, back out to the world and try and raise money independently and make this as an independent film. I didn't want to do that, um, but I was willing to do that. And so as long as I think I'm, I'm just being you know, straightforward about my process and look people in the eye and say, look, it's really cool that you have $100 million and this property that everybody's fascinated about. But if I, if I can't do it my way, then, then there are a million other directors for hire that will do a better job for you. Right. Well, Jeff, I, I'm really excited about where you are right now and where you're going. And I, I want people to see the night special. I think it's really it's something else, man. Well, thank you. I appreciate you watching it. And I appreciate it. It's nice to side. finally have you in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you. All right. Uh, and you can uh, see the film in theaters now and uh, read the review here at HitFix.